Welcome to the Korean Now Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show we have Stephen Nagy. Stephen is a distinguished fellow at Canada's Asia Pacific Foundation, as well as a fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, and he is currently a senior associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the International Christian University in Tokyo. And it's from this vantage point that we're going to be speaking to Stephen today on the podcast. His research offers a unique insight into the regional development of East Asia, how changes in the region are seen from the Japanese perspective, and how all this interacts with both Koreas. The current international discussion of regionalism tends to focus, quite predictably, around Brexit and the European Union. But on the other side of the globe, and with a history that is in many ways more fraught and more unresolved, Asian regionalism hasn't taken the turn backwards that it has in places like Europe. In fact, in many ways, we are seeing a renewed cooperation on issues such as climate change, conflict resolution, non-state actors, natural resources, and of course, economics. And Japan has traditionally led the development of East Asia and Asia in general. There is a famous phrase that runs around the issue, the flying geese model. And this is the idea that Asia develops with Japan at the front and the benefits that Japan discovers filters through to Korea and China and so forth. But as Stephen will show, this model is fallen apart. In its place, something much stronger is taken over. A more equal development, a more equal sharing, and a more equal cooperation. And even when it comes to issues such as the scramble for resources, which traditionally has been a conflict point for many countries around the world, Stephen will show that this is also an area in which East Asia is finding new ways to cooperate and bandy together. And the remarkable thing about East Asian realism is the ground it covers. The extremes of geography, of culture, of ethnicity, of divergent alliances, and of a history of conflict, which in many ways is why people doubt these hopes and these claims for tighter bonds and cooperation in Asia. The view from countries like Korea, or at least that which catches the news headlines, tends to focus around unresolved issues of the past, land disputes, sea boundaries, and insufficient apologies or compensation for war crimes of the past. But this focus tends to be overblown. The idea of a deteriorating security environment in East Asia and of countries unable to move upon the pains of history is something that is just not playing out in practice. And often when security does become the issue, it is the issue of North Korea, nuclear weapons and missile launches, which brings us to the second part of the discussion I'm going to have with Stephen today. That is a look back on the recent summit in Hanoi between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Now this deal seemingly fell apart when, in many people's expectations, Kim asked for too much and Donald Trump gave too little. But Stephen sees this a little differently, just as he sees some of the issues that tend to catch media attention around this subject, such as sanctions relief, reunification, the Vietnam model of economic opening, and the prospects of denuclearization, with a new nuance and one that has often been missing in general media. Now as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener, and you can support it in various ways. You can do so directly at the Patreon link or the PayPal link attached below. Or you can simply comment, share, or like this podcast on social media. All the help is appreciated. On that, and to walk us through regionalism, Abe is Japan, and how the two Koreas fit into East Asia, this is Stephen Nagy. Stephen Nagy, welcome to the Korean Now podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jed. So today we'll be speaking through a number of different aspects of Korea and I suppose specifically Japan and how that relates to Korea. But um, before we get into summits and Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, it's probably best if we start uh, with an anniversary. And this is the anniversary of the uh, tsunami in Japan. It's from 2011. So uh, take us back there for a second here. Tell us what Japan looks like today. And of course, this is a moment for regionalism for how Japan interacted with its neighbors. So I might get you to take us there, give us an overview of that, of that disaster. Many people know what it is, but also tell us where it is looking today and how countries like South Korea did cooperate in this regard. Well, eight years ago on March 11th, so that was just this past Monday, um, in the, what they call it the Great uh, East, East uh, Japan Earthquake here um, in, in Japan, um, there was a, a huge tsunami that came in uh, as a result of an earthquake. And the tsunami um, basically killed more than 18 or 19,000 Japanese um, citizens, as well as uh, foreigners. Um, and more than 100,000 people were dislocated and, and they were moved to uh, 
uh, camps in the northeastern part of Japan. Um, the country itself was devastated in terms of um, how its energy flows were uh, needed to be de redistributed. Um, the government reacted quickly by turning off nuclear power plants. And um, the Japanese government responded very, very differently to the 1995 um, Kobe earthquake in that they worked very carefully with the Americans um, under something called Operation Tomodachi, and Tomodachi means friendship. Um, to allow uh, the transport of goods, to monitor the uh, what was happening in, in the Fukushima plant, um, and to provide supplies and goods to uh, the many people that were dislocated by the um, earthquake and the tsunami. I think importantly, um, what's interesting is that we had countries like South Korea um, come to the aid of Japan, and, and um, they've provided important chemicals to um, cool the Fukushima uh, power plant as well as supplies and funds and it kind of really represented that you know at the at the people to people level and even at the government level that um, these two countries that do have challenges in terms of understanding each other's histories and building a brighter future um, but they did come together at this time of need and 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 it provided an opportunity for them to think about the relationship beyond history and I think beyond security that um, you know, these countries face um, non-traditional security issues like earthquakes and tsunamis, and in order to deal with them effectively, they have to um, put the past behind them and cooperate. Um, now, what's interesting about you know why I'm interested in why the South Koreans and the Japanese cooperated at this particular time, it came after the the visit of uh, of President Lee to um, the Dokto or Takashima Islands, and and this sparked a real um, crisis, in, I think, in both capitals in terms of uh, in increased, um, you know, nationalism and a sense that both countries were stepping on each other's toes. Um, and it resulted in, in a few months where the, the top level leaders weren't talking. Um, but when this um, earthquake happened and tsunami happened, what we saw is that they could put past these nationalist inclinations and really focus on the, the human dimension of the relationships. And I think that's a, a really... Um, it's something that we should reflect on because I think it's something that both countries can build on to um, improve the relationship that they have now. And that sounds, at least from the outside, like a key aspect of this sort of uh, growing regionalism, that despite the idea that you can fight over a number of, I suppose, many historical issues and things that do come up from time to time, the ability to cooperate on a very specific, narrow area of, uh, of, of, I suppose, of any sort of crisis or any sort of cooperation is uh, is important and is one of those things that can show the depth of a, of a relationship. Often in the media and often in TV, you do hear about these crises over Docto and airplanes and uh, uh, crossing each other's airspace, etc. But when you can see this sort of deep co cooperation, especially around uh, this environmental area, so this can, I suppose... Yeah dredge out deeper into pandemics and climate change and natural disasters but it can show the i suppose it can show the depth of a relationship in that way well i think it shows the importance of of of, of building these like grassroots relationships between societies by um, encouraging local governments to build um, transnational networks and um, those transnational networks offer pipelines of communication um, so that they don't need to just focus on you know these really you know, high po po high politics and um, historical issues and national issues um, and I think that they are a really good way to start to um, shift how countries are, are looking at each other. There's another really interesting example um, of looking at how um, Korea and Japan have cooperated, and it's the example of Kita Kyushu. Kita Kyushu is a city on southern Kyushu Island, and it had tremendous um, pollution problems in the 1970s, and it cleaned up its act. And um, in the late 80s, uh, what we saw is pollution problems come back, in particular um, acid rain and PM 2.5 problems. And... Um, the local government there, they, they investigated what was the source of these things, and they found out that it was coming from northeastern, northeastern China. And instead of criticizing the Chinese, um, what the, the Japanese did is they went there and they talked to their local officials and they said, can you want to come over to Kita Kyushu and learn from our experience, um, learn how we cleaned up our cities, um, we'll you know, bring some of your local officials over and perhaps you can come and localize that knowledge back in, in northeastern China. And by doing that, you could deal with some of your pollution problems. And what we saw is that, you know, this approach really 
bridged um, the relations between China and Japan at the local government level. And this initiative has actually evolved into something called the Kita Kyushu Initiative. And um, we have Korean cities in it, and we have um, cities in southern China and Southeast Asia as well. So again, I think that um, cooperation can occur between Japan and, and Korea, uh, not just in terms of disaster, but also um, environmental issues and other issues as well. And uh, these days, what does that regional cooperation look like? Because uh, it is a, a long trope and one that's been spoken about often. And I might get you to introduce the topic, the idea of the flying geese model. And this is the a Japanese-led model of regional development. Of course, it's back. It's backdated a number of decades now. But what does it look like inside Japan these days? Do they is the country still seeing itself as this leader of Asia, or is it more of a equality-based uh, regionalism in this regard? Well, I, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and, and 90s, you know, Japan was, you know, at the pinnacle of, of economic power in the region. It was the most developed country. Um, you know, it had was probably the most internationalized country within the region. Um, and this did give it a position of, of, of where it was at the, you know, the, the forefront of economic development. And many countries within the region looked to Japan as a model for um, developing their economies and their societies. But today, um, you know, China is the second largest economy in the world. It's the biggest economy in the region. It's providing an alternative in terms of development. Um, so Japan is, needs to reshape and reshift its identity it's, because it's no longer number one in the region. Um, but that being said, I think that um, under Prime Minister Abe, that the country has really turned into a, a, a different direction. In some ways, it's become more internationalized. Um, it's a committed to multilateralism. And we saw that with uh, the American withdrawal from the TPP that um, Prime Minister Abe said, no, we're going to continue with the TPP. Uh, we'll transform it into the comprehensive progressive trans-Pacific partnership with 11 members. Um, he signed the Japan EU EPA. Uh, this is all, you know, a commitment to multilateralism. We've also seen um, the Japanese government step up its 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 aid, uh, both ODA, Overseas De uh, Development Assistance, um, and other forms of assistance to Southeast Asian countries and countries in South Asia um, to build infrastructure, to build um, uh, human capital and, and capacity building in these countries so that they can um, really have an alternative to, I think, a, a China-led region, um, but as well as it's as, as tried to uh, convey to uh, other countries within the region that there's lots of alternatives to development and, and the Japanese present the model. So I think that Japan is no longer um, sees itself as a, the leader, but sees it itself as an important leader within the region to provide alternatives to development, to share their experiences, um, and to um, importantly uh, ensure that the liberal international order does remain intact, not only within the region and globally. And, and we see that um, Japan is working very hard with um, Washington to try um, and curb some of the instincts of, of the current administration so that the liberal international order remains intact. And uh, one of those aspects of this cooperation that I've seen highlighted through a number of pieces of your research here is the idea of, I suppose, this scramble for resources. Now, this is one of those things that for many years has, be, has been considered not a source of cooperation, but a source of contest between nations. And of course, today it shifts. You may not, be, people may, may not be scrambling for the same resources, but thing like, things like rare earth resources, which of course are vitally important when you have companies like Samsung and Sony building up their uh, cell phone companies. Um, this idea, this uh, scramble for resources, you put through some of your resource that it, it's through some of your research here that it may not be the terrible thing that is that that we see it to be. It can actually be an incredible source of cooperation in the world. Well, I definitely see that um, countries like South Korea and Japan have so many overlaps in terms of. Um, their needs and and I think that they there is so many possibilities in terms of cooperation and you mentioned Samsung right and and, and Samsung is producing um, the Galaxy phones and these are great great you know um, technologies but they also use rare earth materials right um, so you know I think there's a lot of opportunity for South Korea and Japan to cooperate in, in exploring and and, and um, mining these resources and ensuring that there's a steady flow for of these kinds of exotic materials for um, 
in both countries, you know, products that are really in global demand and, and represent their global brands. But I think that, you know, Rarus is one example. Um, I think that there's opportunities for cooperation in, in the maritime domain in terms of fishery resources, um, in, in terms of um, uh, perhaps exploring energy resources um, in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. Um, it just is a matter of will and, and, and finding those those areas where both countries really see uh, or have the same kinds of, of needs. And I think um, just because, you know, the economic development in South Korea has been so similar to Japan, um, both countries have these large mega, mega, mega companies, and, you know, they call them the Chaebols in, in um, South Korea, but here they're, they're called the Zaibatsu. Um, these two these two economies very much resemble each other. And I think that the if we if political leaders are interested and business leaders are interested, I think that they can find areas of, of cooperation, even in terms of, of energy exploration and, and and getting those energy resources back to their economies. And you mentioned there the idea of fisheries, and you also mentioned mm -hmm. a little bit earlier those two islands, the um, uh, the Doctor Islands and the surrounding islands around there. Um, let's uh, bring that in for a second here. How real do you see this dispute? I know it has extreme historical significance for both countries, but is it one of those things that just catches the headlines and doesn't really affect the underlying cooperation between the two countries? Or is it one of those things that really is a thorn in every single aspect of, uh, of inter-country and bilateral cooperation? And I might get you at this point to introduce uh, the country that we haven't spoken much about yet, which is China, because it certainly seems as though the dispute over the, over the um, Sinkaku Islands, for example, uh, seems to really be one of these uh, flashpoints. But is it such, and is it, or is it just a, I suppose, a veneer that, that is covering up a much broader, friendlier relationship? Well, I think both in South Korea and, and Japan, you know, we have, you know, the staunch conservatives and I think more extreme nationalists that, you know, view these Dokuto Takashima Islands as something really, really crucial to their national identities. But, you know, the every, everyday Kim and everyday Tanaka, you know, they're not walking around the streets of Seoul or Incheon or Tokyo or Osaka thinking about um, getting these islands back from either country. I mean, these are, are, are you know, they're, they're lodestones for nationalist groups within both countries, but I don't think they're the primary drivers of, of the relations between the two countries. Um, in the case of South Korea and Japan, I think that, you know, the Japanese colonization of South Korea, um, the comfort women issue uh, really is, you know, the sticking point between the two countries. And, and Takashima Island and, or these Dokto Islands are, 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 are much more... Um, you know, they're an easy uh, pressure point to press on both sides. And, and I think that they, they can win political points for the more conservative politicians in both countries. Um, I think that this particular issue could be solved quite easily if uh, politicians were um, interested in, in moving um, the territory should between the two countries away from a, 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 a political opportunity to um, something that could be a, a, an opportunity to deepen the relations. On the Chinese side, um, you know, the Chinese view the Senkaku Islands, the Dayutai Islands, um, in a very different way. Um, they go back to the, um, 1894 when the first Sino-Japanese War happened, and um, they ceded these islands to the Japanese legally in, in, in a treaty uh, that they signed with the Japanese. Um, and they view that um, these islands have been traditionally part of, of, of China's historical uh, understanding of itself um, dating back to the Ming period. So they have some maps um, from the Ming period where they um, collected some herbs on, the, on these, uh, these particular islands and they base their, their, their claim or their sovereignty over these islands based on historical claims. Where the Japanese are saying that uh, these islands were uninhabited, they were un uncontrolled by uh, any state within the region at the time, and as a result, that they um, incorporated them into uh, Japan proper, and and that is their legal claim. Um, in terms of how we can understand this today, uh, I think that the international law uh, stands on the side of the Japanese um, because international law was um, has been uh, the primary mediator of sovereignty over the past hundred or hundred and twenty years, um, and. We don't look 
um, prior to uh, this period in terms of thinking about sovereignty. So uh, it's a challenge in terms of thinking about um, the Senkaku Dayutai Islands um, for both Japan and, 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 and China, because China may have a historical uh, case for these islands, but it's not recognized under modern international law. Um, I do think that, go ahead. No, sorry, I was, I was just going just gonna to mention it slightly there. You introduced the question of comfort women, and this is one of those yes. historical challenges that I suppose uh, the, uh, the Chinese still run this gambit a lot. They really do have a lot of historical grievances that they bring up, and it becomes very politicized. But it's also the case inside Korea. And, of course, you are based in Japan, I am based in Korea. But even from this side, this issue seems to be... Um, I, what, it, one of those, those challenging issues that doesn't seem to have a clear answer for it, because in many ways you could see, you you could say that Japan have apologized and they've list and there's a list of apologies people can find online, and the Koreans and I suppose the Chinese involved as well will say the apologies weren't sufficient or they weren't enough or they they or there wasn't enough co uh, compensation for in in this regard, and many people that I've spoken to inside Korea will say one of the one of the things one of the problems with this issue is that uh, anti-Japanese nationalism has become a key part of both countries, uh, China and Korea. And in that regard, it's not something that they can drop. And I get this sense from Japan too that there may be a fatigue building here, that um, um, no matter what apology we give, no matter what issue, no matter how much we address it, we may not be able to give the Koreans and the Chinese what they want. So I wonder how you see it from your side of the, of the, of the Japanese sea. Well, you know, I'm Canadian. Uh, let me be upfront, uh, and I'm a man, so I think commenting on this particular issue um, is is difficult because uh, these women, um, they had a horrible experience, and um, I think that their experiences weren't um, uniform, um, and it, it does put us in a, a difficult position in terms of commenting. But my view on on this issue. Um, is that I think you know you can this great books so for example embracing defeat by John Dower he talks about um, similar systems being set up for American soldiers in post World War II Japan. Um, we saw similar systems being built in post Civil War Korea for American soldiers. Um, this suggests to me that um, the comfort women um, issue. Um, of course, it happened. Uh, it was an egregious attack on hu the human rights of these women. Um, but I do have a sense that there's some collective responsibility, both by um, the users, the facilitators, um, and the collaborators in this particular system. And because of that, I don't think it's an issue that we can untie very carefully uh, because there's so many the issue is so complicated in terms of of, of, of the human rights aspect but also um, the fact that it seems to be have been practiced by um, not only the Japanese but the Koreans and 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 and, and most likely the the users of these systems were uh, not only Japanese soldiers but you know soldiers of Korean ancestry and Taiwanese or Chinese ancestry um, that were fighting under the Imperial Army um, it's a challenge. Now, this issue being used by, uh, you know, a nationalist in, in, in China and South Korea, I think that it's deployed somewhat differently. And I think that um, China and, 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 and South Korea, um, you know, this anti-Japanese is there is, is somewhat of a different nature. I think I, I use somewhat, I call it structured nationalism within the South Korean context, because I think that um, as long as South Korea and North Korea are divided, there's a constant memory structured uh, into uh, both societies of how the Japanese colonial experience has um, divided the people and divided their identity. And, you know, every day the South Koreans and North Koreans are reminded of that um, until reunification or some kind of co-federation can occur within um, on the Korean Peninsula, my sense is that anti-Japanese sentiment will be very, very difficult to remove. Within the Chinese context, um, I think it's very well documented, whether it's by Richard McGregor in, in his book, Asia's Reckoning, or other scholars, um, um, 
it's very clear that the 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 CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, deploys anti-Japanese uh, sentiment and nationalism um, in cycles. So we usually see it before uh, a change in leadership. So when Xi Jinping, before he came into power in 2012, we saw a ramp up of anti-Japanese sentiment um, as he was trying to prove his nationalist credentials, which he has uh, proved very uh, well over his uh, six years in power. And then we see a decline um, as uh, leaders have consolidated. If you watch the cycles of, of anti japanesism that we've seen a decline over the past two years um, in concert with uh, Mr. Trump being elected in the United States. And, you know, this is a practice of economizing enemies where the Chinese say, well, our, our, you know, our biggest diplomatic challenge is the United States and not Japan. And as a result, we need to, you know, uh, decrease the amount of anti japanesism and, and, and nationalism based on this this experience of being uh, going having a, a war with Japan. And uh, this is very pronounced for the past two years. Um, same with South Korea, which is interesting. Um, in 2017, you know, we've had um, the, the Chinese really rebuke the South Koreans for the installation of the THAAD missiles. Um, they uh, they stopped uh, tour groups coming to, to um, South Korea. They stopped purchasing cosmetics and Korean products. But now we've seen a warming of relations between South Korea and, and China. And this is very much related to the troubles between the United States and, and, and China um, in that um, they need to concentrate all their diplomatic efforts. So I think when we look at nationalism and this anti-Japanese question, um, the South Korean case and the Chinese case, from my point of view, is somewhat different. And uh, I suppose a key aspect of this that many people do focus on these days, especially with Abe now in power, is the idea of a remilitarizing Japan. Now, I don't know how much this is a fear rather than, than just a, 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 a hangover from the past that, that, that people want to keep bringing up. But how do you see it from your side? Because there's a bit, as people would know, there's been a lot of talk about changing the the pacifist constitution to allow Japan to do a number yeah. of new things in the world. So, yeah. how how real do you see this debate inside Japan? How likely is it for the constitution to be genuinely reformed in the sense to make Japan a non pacifist nation, as in a a neutral nation? It can be aggressive, it can be defensive in 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 this regard. And uh, how reasonable are these fears of a remilitarizing Japan in your in your view? So I'll start with the, the second question, because I think it's quite interesting. And, and um, you know, we sometimes think that the South Korean and the Chinese experience represents all sentiment in, in East Asia about how East Asians feel about Japan and its past and, and, and how it's changing society. And there was a great poll, uh, a research survey that came out out of the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore over the past uh, month. And in this survey, they, they questioned policymakers and scholars in, South, in ASEAN countries, I think about 2,000 of them, how they felt about China, the United States, and Japan. And interesting, all 10 members of ASEAN had very favorable views of Japan. They wanted more of Japan. Um, there wasn't concerns about Japan militarism. Um, they wanted more partnerships and more of Japan within the region. Of course, South Korea and Japan, very different dynamics. China and Japan, very different dynamics. Taiwan, Japan, much more similar to the Southeast Asian countries. So I think it's more nuanced uh, in terms of how different countries view uh, Japan's uh, more proactive, uh, proactive uh, position within the region. Um, now, how serious is the militarization? I don't think militarization is happening at all. Um, Japan is a shrinking country. Uh, by 2050, it will likely have under 100 million people. Um, and if we look at the pro democratic profile of the, that country, um, most likely they'll have many, many, many old people, not many young people. Um, this wouldn't be a country that would be prepared to go to war or you know, to engage in, in a um, you know, full-scale military uh, invasion of, of a neighboring state. So I think this is a very important thing for us to be thinking about. Um, second, uh, you know, as the population decreases, what about economic power? It's inevitably going to decrease as, as, as the population decreases, which means they have less resources to put into the military. So I think at those two levels, there's very little concern about remilitarization. 
The second, our third, which is really important, is the value level. What do ordinary people, Japanese people value? And, you know, they've enjoyed 70 years of, of pacifist traditions. And I think it's deeply inculcated into the values and everyday thinking of ordinary Japanese. And, um, you know, it would be, un it's, it's unlikely that um, these individuals would choose a uh, change in the constitution that dramatically shifts Japan away from that post-World War II pacifist identity. And we see that in poll after poll after poll. Um, even when the North Koreans um, shot missiles over um, the isthmus between Hokkaido and, and the northeastern part of Japan um, in September 2017, there was no wild, wild, um, widespread calls for changing the constitution. Or when the Chinese are sending submarines and naval vessels um, into Japanese territory. If these wouldn't shift the view of ordinary Japanese on changing the constitution, I, I'm not sure what would um, and then in conclusion, I think that I think there's very little chance for a dramatic change in the constitution. And that should bring, um, you know, I think uh, security and um, a, a sense of, 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 of positive views about Japan's commitment to passivism rather than, you know, more insecurity or concerns about transformations in, in Japanese society. And I suppose that leads us into a question about the political situation inside Japan today and Abe, because a lot of people look at Shinzo Abe and they see him as this face of a of a of a stronger, in some ways, militarized, and all those questions that we spoke about before. This reemerge in Japan, but reading through a lot of your research, he seems to have a lot of uh, extreme difficulties internal to the Japanese political uh, structure here. I mean, just just looking at a single uh, st uh, statistic here. Japan has had 17 prime ministers in 25 years. Now, it seems as it's just looking from the outside here, and I'm wondering what your perspective is, but it feels like it's a country where large-scale political dynamic change might be difficult given that regard. So I might get you to talk about uh, how Abe is sitting now and uh, how you see the changes he has done, because as you know, and as many people listening know, he came into power on a very, very broad popular mandate, and he was talking about economic change and uh, change in, in Japan's status in the world and a number of aspects in this regard. Well, if I told you 10 years ago that the, one of the longest serving uh, international leaders would be a Japanese prime minister, you would have laughed at me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And today, Prime Minister Abe is, is one of the longest serving um, leaders globally, or I think he only uh, President Putin of Russia and Angela Merkel of Germany um, are his seniors. Um, and I think this, you know, his, his uh, longevity as a prime minister has been related to, I think, um, his focus on the economy, his focus on trying to transform um, Japan. And he, I, I think a genuine uh, humility in terms of how he has uh, chosen what is his priorities in terms of, of his policies. Now, why I say that, I think that if you look at his his background, um, I do think he's a conservative. I do think that um, he views that the you know, post-World War II judgment of, of, of Japan's wartime behavior is, is, has been imbalanced. Um, he has a, you know, a track record of visiting the controversial Yasukuni Shrine uh, he sits on committees that um, do want to um, have a different uh, view about issues such as the comfort women issue. But as a governor, as a prime minister, what we've seen is him being very pragmatic, moving to the center, um, prioritizing economic development, prioritizing the restructuring of the Japanese economies through adopting things like womenomics, so promoting women in society, um, corporate governance, um, they just adopted a, a, a migration policy to allow an increase of up to 300,000 migrants into Japan so they could uh, fuel the, the, the labor supplies. So what we've seen is him concentrating on the economy uh, and not this nationalist agenda that um, I think many people expected when he was elected or, or re-elected in 2012. And as a result, what we've seen is uh, a Japanese economy that has grown uh, a Japanese economy that's more vibrant, uh, 
Uh, we've seen uh, Japan commit to multilateralism, like I, I said at the beginning of this interview, the TPP 11 and the Japan EU EPA. Um, we've seen uh, Prime Minister Abe and, and the LDP really focus on the economy. And I, I, I expect that to con continue, is that the only way Japan can really deal with its security issues and its demographic issues is to um, restructure its economy that, so that it can provide for the needs of, of its citizens today, but its citizens in the future. And um, you know that's what the track record suggests. Um, critics will say that he's still closet nationalist, um, that he wants to change the constitution. Um, but I think a, a careful reading of, of what he would like to do is when he says change the constitution, he would like to change the name of the self-defense forces from being a self-defense force to uh, an official military. And by doing that, it would create more transparency of when the Japanese military could be um, deployed overseas. Um, and the challenge up to now is that the Japanese self-defense force, self -defense forces have been um, deployed overseas based on the interpretation of, of uh, successive prime ministers. So I think that his view is more transparency uh, and calling the Japanese military or self-defense forces for what it is, uh, uh, military, uh, would create more um, security for countries within the region because they could have a better understanding of how the Japanese government is, is, is thinking about its military. And you mentioned a few times now the uh, TPP-11 and a number of these yeah. regional uh, economic uh, organizations and this sort of cooperation. So before we move on to North Korea, I might get you to have yeah. a look back on the nature of um, uh, Asian regionalism in this regard. Because as many people would think about regionalism today, it's dominated by this, uh, this Brexit debate, the idea of a European Union that is fallen by its own measure and large nations deciding that they and it's not working for them. And I suppose inside Asia, you don't have the same political integration, of course, but do you see the same sort of um, challenges affecting Asian regionalism or is, uh, and regionalism in general, or is this Brexit debate and this uh, re-emergence of a certain uh, nationalism sentiment around the world or certain desires to control one's own uh, uh, a future in this regard. Do you see this as symptomatic of regionalism, a challenge for it, or is this just a blip along a much more integrated world? That's a, a lot of questions there. So <laughs> I, I think that the, the European Union regionalization project or the integration project is very different in terms of quality and quantity compared to the um, East Asian idea of, of regionalism. And I say that because, you know, our, our in Europe, all the countries were Christian. Um, they had very uh, similar uh, roots. They had uh, engagement between the capitals for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so they already had many shared values and shared political systems, or at least similar political systems. And of course, of course, they had the important driver of the Cold War that pushed France and Germany to come together and to be the nexus of integration for other countries within the region. In East Asia, we have nothing similar. Um, you know, South Korea, um, China, and, and Japan have really not been on the same page of the book for, for many years. Um, and, uh, um, and their different political systems and historical issues have really created challenges in terms of them being the real engine of integration within the region. Um, Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN, um, well, they have, I think, done superficially well in terms of integration. Um, ASEAN really, you know, they don't, the kinds of cooperation that they, that they engage in is really low level cooperation. When it comes to diff difficult political issues or security issues, such as in the South China Sea, we usually see a, a division uh, within ASEAN, which makes them uh, it difficult for them to be, I think, the, the locus or the nexus for integration within the region. Um, now we have um, China, you know, supporting and, and promoting the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, which is shifting, you know, um, regionalization in, in East Asia from north to south um, towards, you know, east to west, so linking China to Southeast Asia to the South Central Asian states and, and moving all, all the way through the old Silk Road, both the Maritime Silk Road and the, the Land Corridor. So what we've seen is regionalization really 
uh, morph and countries are suggesting different kinds of regionalization strategies. And some of these overlap, um, such as the, Indo the free and open Indo-Pacific that the Japanese are promoting and the BRI, and some are very different. So, um, you know, ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six, which was, you know, trying to, to create this vertical um, integration process or regionalization process between Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and other countries. Well, this has really shifted. Um, so I think the regionalization process itself and, and regionalism has taken on a different character as China has become much more economically powerful, as Japan has not has has become less economically important within the region. And as um, US-China relations push China to promote different kinds of international institutions. Um, so that I think that kind of answers your first part of your <laughs> question. The second yep. part in terms of, you know, nationalism, the rejection of, 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 of regionalization, in the European context, and are we seeing that in this part of the world? Um, you know, I think that this nationalism that has, has, has come about in many parts of Europe and the United States and, and you know, unfortunately what we saw in New Zealand um, just yesterday with the, 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 the terrible um, shooting of 49 Muslims at mosques in New Zealand is that individuals in those societies feel culturally marginalized and economically marginalized um, as their societies become more multi-ethnic, more multicultural, more multi-religious. And um, they're, they seem to be ill-equipped to handle these changes. And as a result, they're returning to their nationalist roots to try to reclaim um, something that I don't think that they can reclaim. It's, it's going to be very difficult for, um, for example, uh, the, the, the UK to uh, not be a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. So even if Brexit does occur, it, those cultural issues and those economic issues are still going to be there. The same with Hungary, the same with France, the same with Germany, and arguably the same with the United States and other countries that are facing these these nationalist uh, backlashes in their countries. So I don't see them as 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 uh, as, as the cause of uh, or as a, a, a uh, how would you say this? Um, I don't see them um, really uh, rejecting regionalism, um, and I don't see them related to regionalism. I see them related to the um, inequalities of globalization and their, the, 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 the way that governments have not been able to balance some of these challenges in terms of cultural representation, economic re representation for um, different groups in their societies. So on that, let's move on to uh, the Kim Trump summit and the specter of uh, North Korea. Now, before we jump into the summit, exactly, I, I, this a uh, number of articles that you've written around this issue, and I will link them below so people can go and read them online. Sure, great. But, but one of them is one that I had been thinking a lot about during the lead up to the summit, especially. And there was a lot of talk about the Vietnam model, the idea mm -hmm. that uh, the, the venue for the summit was vitally important because it was giving a message to North Korea that, hey, past enemies and past uh, um, opposing ide ideologies can eventually become friends and everyone can enjoy a greater prosperity as a result. But you put through how this uh, is probably not going to work for North Korea and probably a failed analogy in that regard. Yeah, I think that, you know, when we look at both Vietnam and China, when they began their reform and opening up uh, period, so in the Chinese context, it was the 1970s under Deng Xiaoping, in the Vietnamese context in the 80s in the Doi Moi um, period, or Doi Moi policy, both of these societies were, you know, largely or overwhelmingly agricultural societies. And in both both societies, the Communist Party was well embed embedded in all these societies. So they had a strong institution, the Communist Party, and they had this huge labor sur surplus in um, both societies. And that labor surplus could be moved into uh, the manufacture manufacturing sector to be very cheap labor for um, both countries so that they could produce products for global export and that capital could be accrued and they could you know, slowly build their industrial base and wealth and, and and improve the general quality of life. So this is where I think the, the analogy of both South Korea and China is a challenge because, um, you know, North Korea is largely industrialized. Of course, yeah, of course, there's places that are extremely poor and we have these prison camps and other areas. But, you know, 
I think people fail to remember that in, in the early 70s, North Korea was more developed than South Korea. And this was largely because, you know, the industrial policy they adopted um, allowed them to industrialize very quickly. They had aid from the Soviet Union and they created this industrial base that allowed them to, you know, be relatively prosperous in the 1970s. So North Korea can't really um, benefit from the move of a huge number of agricultural laborers into a manufacturing sector. So I think this is one of the areas that's a challenge in terms of using the Vietnamese and Chinese model is that they won't have that labor, cheap labor surplus in the way that the South, the, the Vietnamese and the, the Chinese had to um, you know, be a huge manufacturing sector that would could could build that manufacturing with cheap labor. Um, second is the role of the Communist Party. I think that um, you know whether you, you you love them or hate them, reality is that the Communist Party in both China, China and Vietnam had this big footprint in their societies and allowed them to organize and mobilize. And they were relatively uh, not corrupt. In the in the North Korean context, um, what is the institution that bring society together, and arguably it's the military and the Workers' Party. Um, but, you know, I do, don't do think it has the same uh, central organizing role um, in the North Korean context that the Communist Party had in Vietnam and China. And as a result, I just don't think it's a good model. Um, third, and importantly, um, the levels of human rights violation and, you know, the existence of prison camps and, um, you know, the fact that North Korea is so corrupt um, creates real challenges in terms of, um, you know, quickly or even incrementally transforming North Korea into some kind of manufacturing powerhouse, um, because the spoils of that will likely go to, um, you know, the existing uh, power holders within the, the North Korean context. And we didn't really see that in Vietnam and, and, and China. So I, I just don't think they're the, a, a perfect model. And if we move towards the summit itself now, I'm wondering how you view, uh, I suppose, the theatre of the whole thing and how it how it ended up. So they both go there for a, um, their second round of talks, direct talks between the two countries. And uh, effectively, Kim Jong-un asked for a complete relief of all sanctions upon their country. And uh, and uh, in, in return for the uh, complete relief, of these sanctions, um, they will, uh, in their terms, denuclearize. But really, what it was was to destroy a single place, which was the Yongbyon uh, nuclear plant. Which, and for many people with their long enough history, would remember this was already technically destroyed in two thousand eight. So, um, I wonder how you see the deal and uh, the theatrics of the whole thing, how it played out, what both sides did, and uh, just the, the the nature of the play on the ground. So. Uh, from this side, I think that um, the summit itself, having a summit, I, I do think any kind of dialogue and diplomacy is a positive step in terms of, of, of ensuring that um, tensions remain uh, relatively low um, within the region. We both live in the region, and I, I, re I remember in 2017, you know, so much concern about a potential conflict on the peninsula. So I think that the summits do, having the summits itself and a de-escalation intention um, is a form of success. And as long as we don't have testing and as long as we don't have um, both countries threatening each other, this is, you know, from our point of view, living in the region and with all our Japanese and Korean friends, this is not a bad thing. Um, in terms of moving towards denuclearization, I think we're very, very, very far away. Um, I do think that the North Koreans have been explicit and they have not really wavered in the position in terms of denuclearization would be the last step in any kind of um, normalization of relations between the United States and uh, North Korea. I think that they have been very consistent is that they would like to move um, simultaneously in tandem. So a concession by the North Koreans for a concession by the United States. And this has been a very much an incremental request. Their focus has been on incremental, uh, simultaneous tandem concessions on both sides. So I think that the U.S. readout was that um, 
the president of the United States said that the North Koreans asked for a total with, withdrawal of sanctions. And the North Koreans said that they only asked for five or six sanctions, those that had been implemented, I think, beginning in 2017. And I think the North Korean uh, story rings much truer than the United States side based on past practices of the North Koreans. Again, incremental, simultaneous, tandem concessions on both sides. The big deal that was offered by the United States didn't match the incremental uh, willingness of the North Koreans. Where do we go from now? Um, hopefully, we'll move back to you know backdoor diplomacy, where the diplomats will discuss things and discuss the details of how they can build trust on both sides. Um, I think it's important that a liaison office is open in Pyongyang and perhaps in somewhere in, in the United States, so that they can have more discussions with both sides. Um, I do hope that um, they can make some concessions in terms of. Uh, some form of sanction relief um, for a, an accounting of the existing capabilities of the North Koreans. This would be a, a, something that I think uh, both sides could do. Um, and I do think that there is a possibility for the signing of an of a, of end of war agreement. Um, this isn't a peace treaty. These are different. Um, but these would be these incremental tandem, you know, uh, steps that both sides could take to build confidence over time. I think the likely scenario, if North Korea ever denuclearizes, is, is something that would take a 10 or 15 year process, both from the standpoint of diplomacy, but the reality that the North Korean economy is a militarized economy, that they need to find jobs and, 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 and reinsert all these people associated with the military into jobs that aren't related to the military. And this will take time. It's not something that can be done in one great deal, um, despite um, what um, uh, President Trump has, has often articulated. And I'm wondering what the view from Japan is on this, within the political and social circles of Japan itself. Because Japan, as much as South Korea, is the country that tends to bear the brunt of most of these uh, provocations. When they test missiles, they fly over, over Japanese waters and Japanese islands, and it, and when sanctions bite, and you begin to realize that inside South Korea, uh, inside North Korea, people are suffering at greater levels. It is often this strange phenomenon of these ghost ships uh, washing up on yeah. Japanese on Japanese soils, which is supposed to, uh, effectively people listening are uh, these Japanese fishing boats, and people and the people on board are just dead. They have gone out to sea with poorly just to try and make some money, bring in some fish. And the poorly maintained boat is broken down and it's washed up on Japanese uh, shore. Everyone on board has tragically died um, through, uh, I suppose, um, dehydration. And um, But also there's the, I'm assuming inside Japan, the great focus in a lot of this is uh, not just the... Uh, the idea of these weapons and these missiles and these uh, and how sanctions might affect them, but also this historical issue of um, kidnappings, this uh, issue that goes back a number of decades now of kidnapped Japanese citizens inside North Korea, and a feeling inside Japan that maybe there are still a number of them there that haven't been allowed to return home yet. Yeah, I think the Japanese view North Korea at four levels. First is the nuclear, chemical, and biological challenge, right? Um, you know. North Korea has proven capabilities to launch these, these systems, uh, and those systems can target Tokyo, or Osaka, or other cities. So that's a very, very important issue. The second issue is these kidnapped Japanese nationals. And we should be clear, it's not just Japanese nationals that are kidnapped by the North Koreans. We have South Koreans, Vietnamese, Europeans even. But you know, this represents a very important place, uh, point for Japanese based on some of their, their, their spiritual traditions where you know, ancestors all are buried in the same the same grave and you know this is a form of uh, you know uh, ancestor worship this is very important you know, people would like an accounting or the government as well as people would like an accounting um third i do think um there's there's concern about what would happen if the regime collapsed uh where would the refugees go would they come to japan could would this be a challenge to japan um, and lastly, I think that there's real human rights concerns. Um, you know, the Japanese see the images of those, those fishermen, as you mentioned, on the ghost ship, um, you know, ending up on the, 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 the beaches of Japan and, and the, the, it's men that have, you know, they obviously from North Korea, 
you know, there's a real human rights issue that, you know, I think is something that Japanese people are sensitive to and, and, and they want a better future for North Korean people. Um, you know, they would prefer a different form of government. They prefer, you know, the prison camps to disappear. Um, and, you know, I do think that there's, there's real sincere hope that it will change. But I do think there's pessimism about the general dynamics of the relationship and really what um, Japan can do um, unilaterally or bilaterally with North Korea to, to deal with some of these issues. There is a, uh, just a couple of final questions here. One of the things that does, I do hear a lot around the region these days is that as bad as the North Korean situation is, and of course it is one of the world's uh, preeminent both security and human rights uh, situations, is that it may just be, uh, once again, a great way to highlight just how cooperative nations like Japan and Korea are in this regard. So, for example, they have many of the same issues. The same, suddenly they realize they have the same security concerns, if this is the North Korean missiles and North Korean um, uh, um, nuclear weapons, but also some of the other issues. They have the same number of, they have a similar issue with American troops based in both countries. And when, as you mentioned earlier, when South Korea, um, uh, uh, I suppose, puts uh, the THAAD, uh, which is the high altitude um, uh, miss, missile defense system inside its country, uh, China react very strongly to this. They see it as a, a, a potential limitation on them. But my understanding inside Japan is that this was seen as a good thing in many ways. Yeah, I think it was seen as, 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 as um, an obvious choice to defend the South Koreans from, from North Korean missiles. Uh, you're right. They have so many shared concerns. And you know, the states need to cooperate, um, but South Korea and Japan should, you know, look at what are the areas that they really have the sh shared concerns. And I think the shared concern about North Korea is one. Um, I think another is the shared concern about, you know, how to manage U.S.-China relations. Um, the South Koreans were penalized because I think, you know, they adopt, they put, they installed these bad missile systems for security and the Chinese saw this as an American strategy. So how can South Korea insulate itself from these kinds of challenges? Um, Japan will likely face these kinds of challenges going forward. Um, you know, I'm Canadian and, and you know that there was this Chinese executive from Huawei that was arrested. And, you know, now Canada has three people that have been arrested in China. One has had their death sentence pushed, uh, has had a, a, a lifetime sentence pushed to a death sentence. Um, so South Korea, Japan, Canada, Australia, all these countries are going to be, um, I think something co in common they have is that the U.S.-China relationship is going to put more pressure on them. And how do they manage this pressure? And I'm going to be hosting a couple of events next month on middle powers and how they can manage these kinds of issues. But they're going to need to work collectively to deal with some of these pressures. And uh, it's a challenge, but it's going to require policymakers to come together and think about their shared interests um, and how they can um, work in those shared interests. And I think you pointed out some really good areas that they can work together with. And as a final question here, I did come across some fascinating aspects in some of your research, and a lot of your recent research has focused on the in, on Vietnam, and as we mentioned it earlier during the summit. So there's an idea that came up through some of your discussions with people here, and this was a, a, um, a journalist inside Vietnam who was saying that despite the opening up and despite all the benefits that came to Vietnam as a result, one of the fears here was the idea that um, they opened themselves up to the world and they opened themselves up to their neighbor, China. And China had all the resources they needed and all the economic development that they needed. And as a result, they lost out in a number of key areas such as uh, um, the East China Sea and a lot of the island development and things like that. So as a final question, do you see a risk here in a potential nice future where Kim Jong-un decides to reform or step down and North Korea does open up and does become a brand new country? Do you see a potential risk in the same way that Vietnam may have had a risk that China would then come in and uh, take over? Or is this something that we just uh, build up into this monster these days and it's really not the challenge that it is? Well, North Korea presents a, a real opportunity for both um, the United States and China. If, if North Korea opens up, perhaps it joins the Belt Road Initiative 
um, that infrastructure that would be linked through North Korea, through China, and probably through South Korea would create a, an a economic zone in Northeast Asia that would most likely you know, be very, very effective and uh, powerful and influential. Um, and that would mean that Pyongyang would be pro Beijing. Um, and I think this would be in very much the interest of Beijing in terms of its uh, growing rivalry with the United States. Um, but this would be a challenge because I think the Japanese would feel that a unified peninsula that is pro-Beijing would likely be anti-Japanese. And it would raise some of those concerns that the similar concerns that the Japanese had in, in the early 20th century that, you know, a, a, a Korean peninsula, and the expression was, is, is, is a dagger at the heart of Japan, um, would, would, would create very secure, uh, very serious security challenges for Japan. Um, on the U.S. side, if, if there was the possibility to flip North Korea so it became at least neutral or pro-United pro States, um, this would be a tremendous advantage for the United States. And I think that it would, it would consolidate the United States' ability to maintain its networked alliance system within the region to constrain um, some of China's more assertive behavior within the region. So I think there's opportunity for both China and Japan, or China and, and, and the United States, um, if North Korea moves in a direction that uh, favors either one of their interests. Um, and uh, this is something that we'll have to see over the years to come, um, which is likely, uh, that's something that I think only the North Koreans can really answer. But at this stage, I think, um, most evidence suggests that North Korea is interested in retaining its nuclear weapons. It's interested in development, and it's interested in development and retaining its security um, guarantees on its own terms and not Beijing or U the U.S.'s terms. So on that note, that might be a good place to leave this off. So uh, a lot of my questions today have been coming from a whole series of articles that Stephen has written, and I'm going to link them below this podcast. I do encourage listeners to go and read them for themselves. They cover a whole range of topics and incredibly interesting. So uh, Stephen Nagy, thanks for coming on the Career Now podcast. Thanks very much, Jed. It was great to be here. Look forward to it again.